Hello, everyone. Um, this, today, this is our pleasure to uh, host Dr. Alec Finn, who is a vascular biologist and interventional cardiologist, currently uh, medical director for CVPAD Institute, and also an associate professor at University of Maryland in uh, Baltimore. And um, I had the pleasure of actually being a fellow with Dr. Finn for many years at Emory University. And um, it is an honor actually to host him today and also a pleasure and delight for us, um, for him and his team to accept our invitation to write this fantastic paper about wall number plaque and, and uh, improve our understanding of this entity. I would like to you know, open up the discussion by this question, uh, Dr. Finn, what is wall number plaque, please? Farshad, first, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, be here today for the interview and, uh, and for the invitation to do a review article for you. It's a fantastic journal. I think it's off to a great uh, start. Um, so your question, what is vulnerable plaque? Um, I would define vulnerable plaque as a plaque that has not yet caused a clinical event, uh, such as acute myocardial infarction or in unstable angina, but is uh, on the precipice of causing that event. So we're trying, the whole purpose of this paradigm is trying to identify plaques that are at high risk for causing events before they actually cause the event. That is actually the holy grail, I think, of cardiology is to prevent events uh, in a selective way, in a, on an individual patient level way. Great, thank you so much. And by that, I would like to open up, you know, you mentioned in your paper and uh, we knew from before the three type of uh, volume of plaques, you know, plaque rupture, plaque erosion and calcified nodules. But I, what I want you uh, to emphasize for us is what uh, uh, intravascular imaging has done for us to better understand these different type of plaques and uh, where do you think the field is going from here? Great question. You know, as, as you um, alluded to, Really, there are three different morphologies of plaque that cause clinical events, at least uh, on a basis of patho pathology examination. Um, the most common, of course, is plaque rupture. That's the most uh, frequent uh, type of plaque morphology causing clinical events. And that we all learn about in medical school, large necrotic core, thin fibrous cap. Uh, which is, uh, has inflammatory cells within the cap. And there's also plaque erosion, a lesser known entity, which is more of a proteoglycans, muscle cell rich, inflammation poor plaque, on top of which the endothelial cells erode, causing plaque erosion. And then lastly, there's calcified nodule, accounting for a minority of uh, uh, events, which is usually seen in older individuals in the mid right coronary artery. And it's really a really nodules of calcium that uh, sort of fragment and erupt into the lumen causing thrombosis. So when we talk about intervascular imaging, you know, most of the data that allowed us to make these discoveries is from pathology. And we really didn't have any clinical correlation until recently that such things were applicable to the clinic in living patients. And so, you know, intravascular imaging, especially optical coherence tomography, because of its high resolution imaging near the lumen, has really allowed us to confirm what we already knew by pathology. And for the most part, Farshad, most of the studies that have been done looking at intravascular imaging plaque morphology have simply confirmed what was already seen by autopsy in terms of percentages attributed to different clinical events. M majority of events, as I said, are plaque ruptures, but a, a fair uh, amount are also plaque erosions in the 20 to 30% range. And then the minority are uh, calcified nodules. Great, thank you so much. That was a great actually summary of different type of plaques. And uh, as you mentioned, I think this uh, intravascular imaging is helping us not to only better understand the plaques, but also how to manage them appropriately in the CAT lab. Uh, there might be differences in how actually we manage these patients. But I would like to change the gear a little bit uh, now talking about a very important actually story, which is the calcium story. And is calcium finally, <laughs> I know it might not have the, 100% you know, solution here. Is calcium good or bad for the plaque? And what are different type of calciums? I think that's very important, not only for clinicians, but the, because of coronary calcium scoring uh, that is uh, being done more and more across the country, many patients, they come and they ask us this question. So is it calcium good or is it something bad for the plaque? Please. Great question. Um, and I think very timely. I do generally agree with you. The topic of 
uh, coronary calcium is extremely important for clinicians and researchers to understand in terms of its relationship to clinical events. Um, you know, as you know, um, calcium is a marker. We use calcium as a marker of coronary disease burden. So overall, calcium, the extent of calcium correlates with the amount or the extent of disease. Uh, so people with higher calcium scores tend to have more disease and to have higher risk of events in the near and far term. People with zero calcium have the least amount of uh, chance of having an event. So I think calcium is a good marker overall for coronary disease. Now, it's actually more complicated than just calcium burden. Calcium in terms of the pathology comes in many different morphologies. And so we can't just talk about calcium. We have to understand the relationship of calcium morphologies to different types of plaques. And what we've shown in a bunch, a bunch of recent papers is for the most part, stable plaques, that is fibrocalcific plaques are the most heavily calcified. Even healed ruptures can be calcified, but really truly unstable plaques, the type you were talking about, the vulnerable plaque, those ten, generally tend to have less calcium and different morphologies of calcium. For the most part, uh, plaque ruptures and erosions, first of all, erosions aren't very calcified, hard to detect them by a CT scan, I would say. And plaque ruptures can be calcified, but most of the types of calcium there are fragmented uh, or small bits of calcium rather than large uh, confluent calcium. Um, and we, we really, in, in pathology, define calcium in terms of these different morphologies. Sometimes we turn it sheet calcium, which is really large confluent areas of solid calcium that can occur in the intimal, uh, intimal space. And those are mainly seen with fibrocalcific plaques. The other types of calcium morphologies, the fragmented calcium, speckled calcium, those occur much more likely in unstable plaques and their pathogenesis still remains, their role in the pathogenesis of unstable plaques remains to be explored. So you, when we talk about calcium, I think the summary is, I agree, calcium is a useful tool for risk gratification. Is it a useful tool to select who's the vulnerable patient? I would say it's more complex than, than just calcium scoring. Great, thank you so much. So and by saying that, I think uh, we can put together that not all calciums are the same. You know, the density, the shape, uh, you know, location, the amount, everything matters uh, beside the other actual characteristic of that plaque and that patient. So I want to actually uh, go to a very important part of your um, paper, and that is now that we know what is Wallenberg plaque, are there things we can do based on the clinical trials and, you know, the information that we have? Are there things that we can do in the clinic to help patients to reduce their risk uh, when they are known to have Wallenberg plaque? meaning that are there interventions like putting a stent is gonna be helpful? Are there medications that can be helpful? Uh, so I know you have a very nice summary and in the table actually in your uh, paper, which I really ask our audience to go through that because it really put things together. But I just wanted to kind of highlight for us uh, what is uh, your take home message for this? I think the, vul the you know, treating vulnerable plaque is still a controversial issue in cardiology because we really don't know how to select on an individual patient level basis, which plaque will rupture or go on to cause clinical events in the near term. There have been large imaging studies that have been done, as you know, Farshad, with um, intravascular ultrasound, virtual histology, uh, the NEARS lipid cordon burden, uh, burden index, that have been done looking at the relationship between imaging findings and events. Now they do show some prediction for events, but not on an individual patient level basis. So I think, you know, it's premature right now to talk about treatment of vulnerable plaques in terms of interventional treatment. I think the interventional treatment of vulnerable plaque, the data is still very much not in favor of treating what we would however we would term a vulnerable plaque in, in the imaging laboratory. I think medical therapy remains the cornerstone for uh, prevention of CAD and clinical events. And of course, we know that that paradigm is evolving in terms of we had lip, lipid lowering therapies, but are we gonna extend that to other types of therapies? Can there be anti-inflammatory agents used? Will those be successful? So far, I would say the data suggests probably not. But we need to, you know, really still invest a lot of money in understanding pathogenesis and molecules to really understand what are the appropriate inflammatory targets to go after. 
great actually segue to my next question, which you brought up the issue of inflammation and how important it is to better understand the role of inflammation in vulnerable plaque and causing acute coronary syndrome. As you mentioned, there are multiple different medications and trials have been done over the last few years. Uh, you know, interleukin-1 uh, inhibitors and uh, colchicine itself, methotrexate. And um, there are hints in some of these trials, but as you know, and you're describing your paper, some of them, they, uh, they don't come uh, cost-free, meaning that, you know, using some of these medications can increase the risk of infection and that kind of, you know, um, given probably overall negative um, effect for that medication. And that's why FDA didn't approve those for these specific reasons. But I think this story is very evolving, as you mentioned. I think, I think there are going to be more uh, more trials coming out, uh, looking at different aspects of these medications. And maybe there are some others that if you can get a little bit more targeted, uh, basically inhibitors for some of these inflammatory pathways important for acute coronary syndrome, they may get rid of some of the off-target effects. So uh, that can actually evolve over time. But I think that's a very fascinating story, and we're all looking forward to that. So I think we actually uh, went through all of your paper, uh, at least the highlights, you know, summary of your paper from um, uh, Eagle Eye kind of point of view. But uh, what do you want to have our audience to take home with them as the final recommendations and final summary of uh, your manuscript? And I, I'm sure everybody now is very excited to go in detail of this and read it uh, carefully, which I strongly suggest because I think it's very up to date and very comprehensive. And it's very actually nice and easy to read through. So if you can give us uh, your final uh, input, I'd really appreciate it. Well, Farshad, I think the you know, take home would be that I would urge all you know, cardiologists and vascular specialists to really have a good familiarity with understanding plaque types, subtypes, and their role in plaque progression. And as you mentioned, understanding the role of coronary calcium in uh, cardiac events. Because I think uh, as we go forward, you know, I, I think understanding more of the role of prevention and risk stratification in terms of not just LDL cholesterol uh, and blood pressure, but other aspects such as CT scans and the role of, uh, you know, the calcium score is important. And in order to understand what those mean, you have to have some more basic understanding of uh, plaque types and atherosclerosis in general. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Finn. I really appreciate your time. Um, the, it was very actually enjoyable to see you and I'm looking forward to hopefully meet you in person at ACC 2022. I hope we can see many of our colleagues there. And uh, if not, some of them are not available at least in uh, future meetings. Uh, it was great uh, again and pleasure. And thank you again from uh, USC Cardiology to be with us today and also put together this very nice manuscript. And uh, I hope you have the great uh, rest of your day. Thank you so much. Farshad, thank you so much for inviting me. It was really a pleasure to see you and to uh, discuss this issue with you. Thank you.